Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, June 15th, 2023. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Carrie Howley, writer at New York Magazine and author of Bottoms Up and the Devil Laughs, A Journey Through the Deep State. And later in the program, Edwin F. Ackerman, professor at Syracuse University on AMLO's legacy for the left in Mexico. Meanwhile, good news from the Supreme Court They voted 7-2 to uphold a federal law that gives preference to Native families in the adoption of Native American children. Largely a win for tribal sovereignty. Thankfully, no Fed rate hike this time as inflation keeps dropping. They won't rule it out, though. And uh, Wall Street bettors are still banking on a recession coming soon. Probably due to the 10 previous rate hikes. Trump reportedly refused to try to settle in the documents case a few months ago. As his lawyer suggested. Losers do that. Miami Mayor Francis Suarez enters the Republican presidential race. Everyone says, who? He didn't vote for Trump in 2016 and 2020. I think that's going to maybe cause some problems. But this is a way to get book sales up. Adam Schiff will not be censured for the Republican uh, or the Russian investigation, I should say, with more than 20 Republicans defecting along with every Democrat. I wish Ilhan Omar experienced that same solidarity from her caucus. Leading voting rights attorney Dale Ho has been narrowly confirmed by the Senate to a lifetime judgeship in the highly important Southern District of New York, a major victory for progressives on judgeships. So that smoking gun of Biden accepting a bribe on audio? Well, Republicans are even now publicly starting to admit it may not exist. Greg Abbott sends more migrants to L.A., as Gavin Newsom considers bringing a legal fight to DeSantis for doing just that. Grand jury indicts Daniel Penny on a second degree manslaughter charge. And lastly, happy birthday to Donald Trump. Just kidding. Marxist revolutionary Che Guevara. It is Trump's birthday today though, right? It was was yesterday. Oh, it was yesterday. Okay. Well, happy Happy birthday birthday to Che Guevara. (laughs) All this and more on today's majority report welcome to the show everybody hello it's an m majority report thursday hello oh, I'm sorry. to excuse, matt oh sorry sorry excuse me it is chase was also yesterday sorry oh so both of them so were tr- yesterday so trump's so trump is also a revolutionary with, with have Chase's. they ever been in the same room yeah, together we, are we certain they no, didn't? i'm joking i mean <laughs> uh when did che guevara die what 1966 67 Se- seven, yeah 67 so when trump was a you know 21 year old man I mean, perhaps the spirit lives within him in yeah. some way. Absolutely not. That's the great guy, the late great Che Guevara. I, I, Puerto Rico. <laughs> Puerto, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Um, that tribal uh, law that was upheld by the Supreme Court is a really big deal um, because it, it's really about tribal sovereign tribal sovereignty. But what it also does is acknowledge in some way the immense harm that we inflicted upon native families and their family structure is a part of genocide like like it's in the in the genocide commissions and definitions you will see things like um 
uh, removing children from their families and rehousing them with, for instance, white parents has happened in the, to uh, the Lakota and Dakota in Minnesota. Um, um, Didn't it happen in Chile under Pinochet too? Like, uh, I, I think I think it's basically like a, yeah. a, a common thing, especially in like settler colonial contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and but like I, there's a famous historian who writes about the Dakota stuff, and there's a troubling passage where he's like, "Oh yeah, I used to help my grandma go." pick up native babies and help them find new homes in Christian communities. And it's like, uh, that uh, is something you should maybe look a little bit more quickly at in your yeah. own personal history, sir. Right, exactly. And um, in, in like the Times write-up of, of this uh, decision, the, it was about, the law that was at issue was meant to at least rectify that in some marginal way because around a third of native children were removed from their parents, to Matt's point and put up into put into foster care put up for adoption and then they were placed in, in non-native homes it was a it was a part of our genocide against the indigenous population in this country so yeah i mean even this extremist right-wing supreme court can at least acknowledge that thankfully and it was a seven to two decision yeah, um, and of course gorsuch's. alito and, and thomas are, are right. the dissenters the freaks that they are it's weird how gorsuch is uh i mean we should find something on gorsuch's native policy because he's actually um much better than you would expect from a republican or even well i mean <laughs> any supreme court justice it frankly. turns out though uh, that sometimes on some of these more niche issues when they're removed from like the incentives set by the federalist society they right. can have their own opinions um because right. there's no leverage their lifetime it's a lifetime appointment but um speaking of republicans senator lindsey graham went on Shan saw on, uh, sean hannity's show last night to you know speak about Trump critically, right? I mean, this is a bad thing for the Republican Party to have the front runner for the nomination and the former president indicted for the first time in our history on federal counts, multiple dozens of federal counts because he hoarded documents and refused to return them when asked politely many times by federal authorities. Obviously, I'm just, I'm kidding. Uh, Lindsey Graham did not speak critically of Donald Trump. That's something he used to do. We'll get to that in a second. He went on Sean Hannity's show to to sloppily suck up to the guy and wish him a happy birthday instead. Oh, I, I agree. And happy birthday, President Trump, because he's watching this show. Oh. So oh, I talked birthday. to him. Hey, hey, pal. Oh, okay. Uh, you had dinner with Melania and Ivanka. We got your back. President Trump, we have your back. This is not about you. It's, it's about embarrassing. Us. Why is there a lot of audience? You could take the Dalai Lama and make him the Republican nominee that tried to destroy his life. They hate conservatism. This is a bunch of BS. President Trump, you're going to prevail. You're going to be the Republican nominee, and you're going to be president again. Just hang in there. The studio audience. Uh, this is a what thing that mean? Hannity's been doing. Oh, look at that. He's like, as happy as a clam. It's like Joe McHale doing like talk soup vibes. Yeah, this is the soup. With Sean I feel like I'm watching The View. Um, Hannity now does it where he has the um, so he has the live, live studio audience back. And he also says uh, he also brings out his Hannity stitch footballs um, and he'll throw them into the crowd. Oh, yeah. Oh, so there's some crowd work from yeah, Sean. Exactly. I mean, he just wants to, he does give off like old. Maybe he was a quarterback in high school. And, and, and no, he, there's a famous story up. about this. Sam can fill us in on. But he was like into golf or some sort of womanly sport. Oh. And uh, <gasps> Roger Ailes said, hey, uh, that's soccer. I think it was like you got to get that out of oh, here. Oh, that's two euro. Football. So he's overcompensating by throwing footballs into crowds. Great. That says a lot about uh, Fox's perceptions of masculinity. But the reason I play that is because um, Lindsey Graham is not the only I mean, he's known to be the, the guy that is the most like obsequious, obsequious <laughs> suck, sucking up to whoever the strong man is in the Republican Party at the time or whoever he's decided he's going to serve. Um, he is a servant in that way. He did that with John McCain, even though they were friends. That was his role in their relationship his entire uh, uh, career. But J.D. Vance, another esteemed Republican senator. This guy was supposed to be a different brand of Republican, but he's really just a, a crypto fascist uh, venture capital guy. But he went on Laura Ingram's show, making the, uh, the senators making the rounds on Fox News last night and spoke about Trump being uh, federally charged. And uh, he's upset about it as well, not just because he's endorsed Trump for president, uh, but because of 
this? Uh, it's hugely significant. And this is the argument I make. Look, I'm, obviously, I've endorsed Donald Trump, but I would make this argument to people who are not going to support Donald right. Trump. This is really not about who was president. It's about the office of the presidency itself. Do you use that office to harass your political opponents or do you use that office to enforce the law? What we're seeing here is such selective enforcement that you're absolutely right. It's going to destroy the people's faith in equal administration of the law. If you have Democrats facing one set of principles and Republicans facing the harshest application of the law, then you're going to eliminate people's faith that the law is about what you do and whether you do it the right way and not about that politics. Military? Who's going to sign up for that's, that military? That's exactly right. Well, Why are you going to sign up for a military that is applying justice unequally? Why are you going to send your kids to, to uh, law deprivation, school? Why are you material, going to pay your taxes? Promise. The entire foundation of this country is that whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we all face the same justice system. Joe Biden's Department of Justice is going to war against that principle. They're going to break the country unless we stop it. Uh, J.D. They're going to break the country. Um, I mean, I... Who pays taxes? No one signs up for the military because they... Uh, I think the D Department of Justice is fair. Right. Because, <laughs> like, you know, I, uh, there, uh, people aren't signing up for the military because they have faith in Merrick Garland recruits or something like that. Re recruits go straight into the recruiting center and like, hey... This, this Department of Justice is really cooking lately. Where can I go kill people for this country? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, I, I would say that the American military is somewhat of a consistent through line with our uh, justice system and how we operate as an empire in the world. But, okay, so these guys support Donald Trump. They're sticking up for him. But just so everybody understands how craven this is, I will always play this clip of Lindsey Graham in 2016 and then read this quote from J.D. Vance every time they go so hard in support of their buddy Trump. This is who they tr this is who they truly are. They have no principles whatsoever. This was Lindsey Graham in 2016. Play it every time. Your reaction to hearing what Donald Trump says. I disgusted. it. Well, I want to talk to the Trump supporters for a minute. I don't know who you are, and I don't know why you like this guy. I think what you like about him, he appears to be strong when the rest of us are weak. He's a very successful businessman, and he's going to make everything great. He's going to take all the problems of the world and put them in a box and make your life better. That's what he's selling. Here's what you're buying. He's a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. He doesn't represent my party. He doesn't represent the values that the men and women who wear the uniform are fighting for. I've been in the Air Force for 33 years. I retired this June. He's the ISIL man of the year, by the way. He just got back from Morocco a week ago this Monday. I know. We interviewed you live from there. You were with mm -hmm. Senator John McCain. And you were All right, we got it. Tour. We got it. But he got xenophobic bigot. And J.D. Vance, this was a screenshot of a private conversation that he had with uh, his roommate in college at Yale, who is now a state senator himself, chose to uh, put this out publicly. Thank you for the public service, Josh McLaurin. J.D. Vance said this about Donald Trump. But I'm not surprised by Trump's rise, and I think the entire party has only itself to blame. We are, whether we like it or not, the party of lower income, lower education, white people, and I have been saying for a long time that we need to offer these, those people something, and maybe hell, Maybe uh, and hell, maybe even expand our appeal to working class black people in the process or a demagogue would. We are now at that point. Trump is the fruit of the party's collective neglect. I go back and forth between thinking Trump is a cynical asshole like Nixon, who wouldn't wouldn't be that bad and might even prove useful or that he's America's Hitler. How's that for discouraging? I would say the most discouraging part is that now, J.D. Vance, you have endorsed that person who you described in that text as a uh, potentially America's Hitler. And that Lindsey Graham so easily can now be his biggest cheerleader because this is an authoritarian party. Um, uh, this is a, uh, it, it, but it's a hallmark of, of uh, fascism in this way, too. The strong man at the top. And they will sink to no, no low. Uh, they, they can't sink any lower, honestly in their backing of this guy. Well, there's only certain types of energy that they can use to generate people to the polls, and it's not tax cuts. Yeah. Uh, and there's an, one other thing, uh, you know, I would uh, encourage Matt Stoller, who recently took the left, uh, erstwhile elite left-wing critics to task for not updating their priors because 
uh, JD Vance was supposedly helping, uh, let's, what do you say? Um, implement rail safety rules. Uh, and I'll just say there's a story in the lever mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. JD Vance quietly helped chemical industry lobbyists weaken his rail safety bill. So I would encourage Matt Stoller to update his priors about earth wing, left wing critic priors because, uh, Left yeah, that wing seems to be right there. Exactly. Julia Rock on that story. Great story yeah. in the lever. Friend so, the um, uh, but yeah, this is, there's a good distillation. If you want to send this to your family and friends, this is the GOP. <laughs> the contrast between those two statements. There's, there's nothing that they won't say cynically to get your vote. There's no principles at play here, except, you know, obviously the rich get richer. All right, guys, before we get to Carrie, we have a word from one of our sponsors. Liquid IV, which I used, I use almost every day, honestly. Hydration isn't only for people training for championships and marathons. It's about daily maintenance. It's for airport travel days, standing on the sidelines of your kid's soccer game, especially in the summer, back-to-back -back conference calls or neighborhood walks. Proper functional hydration is essential, and Liquid IV is the number one powered hydration brand in America. Their hydration multiplier is the one product you're missing in your daily routine. Um, I, I gotta say it's, uh, something I sometimes have before a workout, which you definitely can use. Uh, if you're traveling, they mention that as well. Or if you've, you know, gone out drinking, it's kind of helpful for the next morning. I, I got, just got to say, but with one stick, you can hydrate real time, two times faster than water alone. Plus get essential vitamins and three times the electrolytes as leading sports drinks. There's a lot of junk in those sports drinks, but not in liquid IV. It comes in 12 delicious, refresh refreshing flavors to keep your hydration routine exciting. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. It also contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. Very important. With three times the electrolytes of leading sports drinks, it's made with quality ingredients, non-GMO, and free of gluten, dairy, and soy. Liquid IV believes that equitable access to clean and abundant water is the foundation of a healthier world, and they partner with leading organizations to fund and foster innovative solutions that help communities protect both their water and their futures. To date, Liquid IV has donated over 39 million servings in 50-plus countries around the world. Uh, real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco or... You can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code majority rep at checkout. That's 20% off anything when you shop better hydration today using promo code majority rep at liquidiv.com. I mean, some of my favorites, I've been getting into that pina colada, stealing a few packs from the office. Don't tell Sam. I like passion fruit. I like strawberry. My classic is acai. Uh, but all of this stuff is really good. 20% off anything when you shop Better Hydration today using the promo code Majority Rep. Majority Rep at liquidiv.com. All right, guys, quick break and we'll be back with Carrie Howley. We are back and we are joined now by Carrie Howley, feature writer at New York Magazine and author of the new book, Bottoms Up and the Devil Laughs, A Journey Through the Deep State. Carrie, uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me. For sure. Um, I was saying this to you in the break, but like in terms of pieces that have aged amazingly well, I encourage everyone in this audience, go check out Carrie's piece on Tulsi Gabbard in New York Magazine from 2019. 
deep dive into uh, her life. And it's a great way to understand why she's so damn weird and whatever's going on right now. <laughs> so I um, uh, appreciate that, Carrie. And uh, congratulations uh, on this book, as well as writing the screenplay for, for the movie winner about reality winner, who is like, I would say very much the emotional center um, of, of your book here. Why, why for you was reality so central to the story that you wanted to tell about you know, the deep state in America and how it determines the truths and untruths fed, fed to us? Thank you for asking that. Um, I, I think this book is born of an anxiety that many of us feel right now, which is that we've lost control of our identities and that there are pieces of us on email and you know, in the cloud and in Facebook messages and texts. Um, and that those pieces of us can kind of be ripped apart and consolidated into a person we don't recognize. Um, it's, it's more than taking something out of context. It's building a different narrative. And a very extreme case of this is the case of Reality Winner, who is a whistle, a young whistleblower who was portrayed using just those methods through texts, um, chats with her sister, jail calls, um, in a completely ridiculous way as a deep state terrorist. And this is this was the prosecution story. It was a story that the judge was very sympathetic to and took this pretty, um, you know, essentially harmless 25 year old and portrayed her as such a danger to society that she wasn't even let out on bail during um, her trial under the Espionage Act. And um, so, you know, obviously that's that's an extreme case, but there's a sense that we have lost agency that I think is common among all of us. I mean, how did they uh, build that narrative about her? I guess it would be useful for you to remind people a bit about her story, um, how she got into the position that she was in versus the insane, you know, narrative built by the government to lock her up in under the Espionage Act, which is obviously in the news right yes. now so, uh, so, for Trump. <laughs> so really relevant because a very different defendant has been charged under the Espionage Act. Right. Um, so yeah, Reality was a 25-year-old who was working as a contractor at the NSA. And, um, you know, she was going through kind of a quarter-life crisis. There was a lot happening for her. And she came upon a document that she didn't really need to be reading, um, which wasn't related to her work. A single document that suggested to her that Russia had been involved in attempts to overturn the 2016 election. It was just this account of the simple phishing attack on a voting system in Florida. And so she thought to herself, why doesn't everyone know this? I mean, this was a time when this was a very live question. You know, if you turn on the radio, you turn on cable news, people were arguing, oh, well, there's no evidence. Well, she felt that she had evidence and she wanted to see how it would play out. So she printed it out. She stuck it in her pantyhose. She walked out of the NSA and she sent it to The Intercept which mishandled the document and she ended up in jail for four years. Right. And um, can you talk a bit about the Intercept's handling of this? Because I think, you know, maybe I, there's some hesitancy uh, to go after the Intercept on the left because of how much great work they do and how many great reporters they have there. Um, we have them on the show regularly. But you you don't pull pun punches about the way that The Intercept handled this information. And to be honest, obviously, it was a massive, massive mistake. And she bore the brunt of it by going to jail. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I share with you um, your admiration for so much of what The Intercept has done. They've really filled a hole in, in what, you know, there ought to be an adversarial journalistic process. And, and that just didn't exist with regard to the national security state until The Intercept appeared. Um, in this case, it was just a complete absence, it seems, of protocol. So they received, you know, in a mailbox, a P.O. box, this document that seemed to have come from nowhere. And that wasn't how reporters at The Intercept say that they were used to dealing with documents. There was this whole very complicated protocol for dealing with the Snowden documents at The Intercept. And it was actually so complex and onerous 
that people complained about it. They said, you know, is this theater? Because this is so annoying. We have to go into this little room to report on these documents. There's cameras everywhere. We have to log everything. This is so annoying that like lots of good potential work isn't getting done. But for some reason, this document that Reality had said had sent never entered that stream of, of action. Um, it was just handed to a reporter who, again, for some unknown reason, did not go over, like literally across the room <laughs> to where sat some of the best digital security experts in media. I mean, they were just never consulted. And um, I mean, the document was mishandled in many different ways. I think someone who knew more of digital, about digital security wouldn't have just posted it online right. where the document contained various identifying marks. Um, certainly someone involved who knew about digital security would not have um, sent, you know, a text containing an image of the document to some, to whoever does public relations at, um, or whoever that was a spokesperson for the NSA. And kind of all of these missteps added up. Um, I think the intercept would say, oh, she would have ended up in jail anyway. Um, but there's no question that this process is not one anyone defend would defend at this point. Right. I, I mean, so essentially there was like a digital footprint that was not revealed or not uh, removed, I should say, that revealed that reality, like it was able, they were able to trace her to the leak of the information. Yeah. And, you know, there's really no way at this point for a government employee to print out a classified document and not have it traced because everything is being logged. Right. Um, so I think what somebody would have, you know, what, what people are doing more often now is just taking a document and instead of posting it, maybe summarizing it. Right. Like there, there are, there are ways to, um, there are more sophisticated ways to deal with leaked information than just slapping something online. Right. Yeah. And that, <clears throat> so, um, I mean, how, how then after this, you know, information was given to the intercept and it was published and then clearly the government was able, then I guess this was 2017. Now Trump's in office. This had to do with, Russian interference in the election. Obviously, he's, you know, called that a hoax <laughs> hundreds yeah. and hundreds of times. And it is incredibly ironic, by the way, that he's currently being prosecuted under the Espionage Act, the same act uh, his government used against reality winner Daniel Hale, um, other whistleblowers in this way. But how then did they build this case against her? What was the government's portrayal of reality winner versus the reality? Well, I mean, no pun intended, the reality of who she was is so so reality is a millennial she's really funny she's really sarcastic a lot of her communication with was with her sister with whom she had this particular banter and so you know they were having a conversation i think about climate change and reality texts her sister well i only say i hate america three times a day lol <laughs> and that's good in the courtroom <laughs> in the courtroom right you have a prosecutor saying oh she says she hates America three times a day. And suddenly this completely tossed off comment becomes, you know, this profoundly ominous desire to destroy us all. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that kept happening. Little things like, well, why does she have so many laptops? How many laptops, like old laptops do you have in your house? Right. right. Like, um, you know, that she had um, used BitTorrent, like that she had been on different websites, um, that she'd she had been trained. She's an NSA linguist. So she'd been trained in Dari and Pashto languages used um, in certain areas of Pakistan. She knew Farsi. And so she was interested in using those languages, not just to eavesdrop on people, which is what she'd been trained for, but to communicate. And so she was interested in those regions and her interest in those regions was then taken as ominous, a sign of something unusual. Um, she had become, after 9-11, she'd become very interested in language because she, her father had told her that if we could communicate better, um, then maybe 9-11 could have been prevented. And so she started learning Arabic at like the age of nine. And the prosecutor portrayed this as very strange. Um, 
also, you know, she's she wasn't allowed to talk about her work because it was classified. And so her parents gave this very moving, convincing testimony about all her volunteer work. She's like a deeply good, civic minded, involved person. And then the prosecutor would say, well, you can't really know her, can you? Because she can't tell you about her work. So essentially, like the nature of the person the government had made reality winner was used against her. It really is like a, a, much like the prosecution of all of these whistleblowers, right? Uh, like Chelsea Manning is one of the gravest like injustices on this front in the 21st century. Um, you know, uh, the like y you don't just highlight reality winner, although, of course, she's the, so central to the story. You talk about other uh, whistleblowers, uh, even some less talked about, like John uh, Kiriakou. I hope I'm, I'm yeah, pronouncing yeah. that right. And I, I would also mention Daniel Hale, who is yes. a drone whistleblower who also leaked to The Intercept, um, who is a deeply good person who felt guilty, as did reality, about his participation in the drone war um, and is in jail right now. Yeah. It, it, t do you mind expanding on, the, on his story a bit? Sure. He was someone who... Um, hadn't had many opportunities growing up, who looked to the military as kind of a way to get out of his town. Um, very bright kid. Also, as with reality, a linguist. And um, he had some very deeply unpleasant experiences um, as a tech in the drone war. And he carried that guilt with him. It was, it was a a profound burden for him. And he essentially, the only way he felt he could expunge that guilt was to reveal a lot of information about civilian deaths that he had found while working at the National Geospatial Agency. And so he, he, many, many more documents than reality, he revealed to The Intercept, which then published them. And um, he's currently in prison. Um, and I guess we'll just shift. Uh, yes, obviously, solidarity with Daniel Hale, another yeah. incredible grave injustice. And, you know, you you talk, you tell all these stories here, and it's really under this umbrella narrative of how r truth in the 21st century is as uh like flexible as possible and yet there's so much information out there to aid the maximum amount of flexibility like the 21st century has been defined by the mass hoarding of everybody's information in this way and yet you you talk about how how that helps narratives like the ones you discuss um because the government has all this information at their disposal, it's so uh, easy to manufacture truth in that way. Precisely. That is that is so well put. Um, and I would also say it's so asymmetrical because everything is classified. And this is something you see getting out that, that isn't really being discussed in terms of the Trump indictment. Like to say that something is classified is essentially to say nothing about it. There's someone in my book, Kiriakou, as you mentioned, who says, you know, if you're at the CIA and you invite your wife to lunch, like that's classified because you're everything by default is classified. And so there's all the, the national security state creates this like intense aura of mystique over essentially like incomprehensible amounts of information. And um, there's no de essentially no declassification going on relative to how much is being classified every day. And that puts people in a weird kind of precarity because, you know, this is what fascist governments do. They, um, I'm not saying that our government is fascist, but. Well, we've got some fashy parts. <laughs> we can say that. Um, yeah. But this sense of putting everyone in a position where it's impossible not to break the law. It's very difficult not to break the law and then selectively prosecuting different people. Um, and people are very, even though it essentially means nothing to say that something's classified, people are still very taken in by the mystique of, a classified document. And what's so ironic is that's what Trump got in trouble for, right? Like he, he, he was taken in by the mysterious aura of classification and wanted to show people, you know, what he was allowed to, um, you know, to have or wasn't allowed to have in boxes. So, um, you know, there's, it's, it's just a mess. <laughs> and in a strange way, it's a relatable mess because, 
you know, we've all got, or at least I do have like tons of disorganized data in places I don't really even understand where it is. But I think people don't realize how analogous that situation is to our own governments. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Oh, math. Uh, we had uh, Matthew Connolly on, right? Uh, the Declassification Engine, um, a book that just came out. Thank you, Bradley, for finding that so quickly. Um, yeah, it's that was just about how over the past, I don't know how many uh, decades, we've just decided everything's classified, basically. And it was it's in the name of national security. And yet it has allowed for like not the deep state in the way QAnon talks about it, but really, yeah, yeah. this entire apparatus that um, is able to act with impunity just based on like what we've decided was important uh, as an American empire, which is to give these agencies untold power. And that includes over the mass hoarding of information. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's why, you know, the Espionage Act is a law that really isn't worthy of a free society. Um, you know, the Espionage Act doesn't, it, reality was not given a chance during her prosecution to say, hey, I did this out of a sense of obligation. I thought people ought to know this. I was trying to inform the public about something I thought they deserved to know. She was prosecuted just as if she had done it, you know, for fun, like Trump or um, as an act of espionage, essentially, right? Like there's yeah. no ability to argue for noble intent. It's just, did you have this thing that the government says is classified? And when you try to prove that it wasn't important, which like her document really wasn't particular, like no one has died or even been put in harm's way, um, as a result of that document being released, the government will say, oh, well, you're not going to be able to build any sort of case because any documents you would like are not available to you and to show them to you would put people in danger. Right. So there's like this yes. blanket well, argument that all of this documentation somehow is, um, you know, a grave national security threat. And it, I'm incredibly skeptical at this point, anytime the security state makes that argument. That is such a great point, because that was the number one argument against Chelsea Manning was mm -hmm. the fact that she revealed United States war crimes, how we were, you know, uh, like soldiers torturing, uh, shooting civilians and laughing from Apache helicopters, that that was in some way threatening our troops. And then, yeah. you know, to, to Edward Snowden, to but like for Reality Winner, she was revealing what had already been talked about that Ru the Russian government was like trying to tilt tilt the scale slightly uh, for uh, for Donald Trump. It was just confirmation and it had nothing to do with any intelligence operatives. Like the idea that you can make that argument with a f straight face is laughable. And yet they do. They do. And it was the, the extent to which her defense was hampered by insane logistical details having to do with classification, like her, the, the government has all of this infrastructure to, um, to hold secret conversations, classified protected conversations. But, you know, if you just go out and hire a lawyer, they don't. So they always had, they had to figure out having classified phone lines. Every time all of her lawyers meet, met, they had to meet in a skiff. Anytime they went on a document, they were told either they couldn't have it for national security reasons or that, you know, it would be too dangerous to show them essentially. Right. Um, and so it was, it was basically impossible. It was impossible for her defense team to put that document in context because they just weren't given access to any other documents. They weren't even allowed to read the document that she, um, they couldn't like Google on their computers, the document that she'd already leaked that you and I could, that would have been <laughs> illegal for them to do. It's just unbelievable. Um, as we kind of wrap up here, I wanted to ask you about the title of your book, just to kind of bring it all together, Bottoms Up and the Devil Laughs. Um, I I didn't remember where that came from, <laughs> but it comes from, uh, well, I guess you can you can tell the story and why you felt it was uh, like a, a great title to kind of tie everything together with your book. This is a book that tries to take seriously much of what we dismiss as paranoia. Um, as you said, there is a deep state. It's just not the deep state that 
Q is revealing to us, right? Um, and so the title is taken from a 2012 viral video in which a woman is famously and honestly very ably arguing that monster energy drink is a tool of the devil. Mm -hmm. And she has all of these different arguments. Look at the numbers on the bottle. Look at um, this upside down cross. Um, and I think, and that's, you know, on the surface absurd, but when you look more deeply into the corporation that is monster energy drink, when you see their history of, um, of uh, basically discrimination against women in their employ. Also the way that they have gone so profoundly against, they've used copyright law to go against any hobbyist, like the smallest mom and pop business that tries to use the word monster or beast will get a letter from Monster Energy Drink. I'll probably get a letter for saying that. Um, there, there is a kind of interesting truth, I think, to her argument emerges. And um, it's also just a wonderful, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderfully well-argued clip that I encourage everybody to watch after we're done talking. <laughs> well, I mean, that's amazing that you say that because it, it's like, come on, I mean, it's, it's insane. But what you're po pointing out is like that it's this like the hoarding of information in that way and like the corporate then like structure to define itself at all costs it 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 it's a it creates paranoia it creates and, and what paranoia. is the devil but a shapeshifter right the devil's not going to appear you know with horns and you know a, a picket uh, whatever like the this is how the devil appears if you know if we're going to take the devil as a concept so um yeah, and 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 I do think there is an analogy to the way we are, we're kind of dismissive of people, but these stories these that people have about the deep state they come from somewhere. They come from the knowledge that so much is happening in these incredibly resourced agencies that we have no access to, and that whistleblowers, as you'll call Q, is a whistleblower, mm. are some of the only people who are willing to show us what's really afoot. Right. Exactly. Um, well, Carrie Howley, I really love your work and I'm happy that we were able to have a conversation. Uh, the book is called Bottoms Up and the Devil Laughs, A Journey Through the Deep State. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. All right, guys, taking a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by Edwin Ackerman. <laughs> We are back and we are joined now by Edwin F. Ackerman, professor at Syracuse University, whose piece in New Left Review is entitled The AMLO Project. Uh, Edwin, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, uh, Edwin, let's start at, at base level here for large American audience. Might not be or some people might be watching from Mexico, but um, who is AMLO? Uh, uh, Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador, I guess is mm -hmm. how you say the full name. And how did he rise to power in 2018? He's about to be term limited out in 2024. So it, uh, you know, but a, a president who has been definitely left of center. And I think a lot of people view him as a leftist success story. Right, right. Uh, he has obviously a very long uh, political history. He's been a sort of uh, staple of Mexican politics, I would say, uh, since at the very least the year 2000, uh, depending on how you're counting, that's when he became mayor of, of Mexico City. Um, and he's ran for presidency for the presidency uh, three times, winning the, the, the third time, um, and has always, uh, in one way or another, sort of uh, uh, flown the flag of uh, anti-neoliberalism or critiques at the very least of, of, of the neoliberal turn. I think that would be 
the sort of more consistent uh, element throughout the years that has uh, identified him. Uh, the victory in 2018 uh, was uh, a rupturous moment. Uh, it came after two very difficult runs, one in particular in 2006, in which um, he claimed, at least from his perspective, that, that there had been fraud. Um, and by the time that he won in 2018, there had been a significant um, crisis of representation with all the mainstream uh, parties of the period. Uh, so he won uh, by really big margins. Um, so from the beginning of his presidency in 2018, he's had a significant amount of, of um, let's say, political capital or, or, or legitimacy um, that he's you know, maintained or worked with uh, throughout the, the, his, his tenure. And he's maintained a very high popularity rating within uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and when he did win in 2018, he had like a massive lead over his his closest contender. Um, and, and he's basically essentially maintained a, a popularity throughout his entire uh, presidency. Yeah, yeah, he has. I mean, if you if you so, yes, the the. The, in the actual victory of 2018, he won by 30 points in a four-way race. So that's wow. a gigantic uh, margin. Um, and he's maintained the popularity at around the mid-60s, depending on, on how you're counting, if you average it out. Now, there's some interesting sort of uh, elements to that trajectory because it hasn't been exactly uh, at that level throughout the years. There was, for example, a significant dip at the very beginning uh, of, of the pandemic. So in the summer of 2020, for example, that was his lowest point. Um, so part of this, the story is, yes, on the one hand, uh, retaining that level of support, but also coming back from that dip during the summer of 2020 when the pandemic started. Uh, his his party Morena, um, the, it, he founded it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? right. Um, right. What are what's the party's history? What uh, does what are the planks of the party, uh, right. and what's its future post AMLO? Right. So it's a very recent party founded in uh, in 2014 as a party. It existed as a as a, as a type of social movement organization before that. AMLO himself, uh, as I was saying, has this long uh, political history. He began in his his first uh, um, uh, experience with party politics was as a member of the PRI, which uh, for people who might not be familiar with, uh, is a party that stayed in power in Mexico throughout most of the 20th century, uh, was a party that was the hair of uh, a revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, over the course of the years becomes a um, authoritarian and eventually also presides over the neoliberal turn. But during most of the 20th century, it essentially presided over, over, over a mixed economy, a Keynesian economy. And it's in that period in the 70s in which uh, AMLO as a 20-something uh, uh, year old jo joins that party. That party was then gonna have a significant uh, split uh, to the left. Its left flank broke off in the late 80s. Uh, precisely as the party uh, leadership was making a full conversion into, into neoliberalism. The break in the 80s produced a party called the PRD uh, that is still around, even though it's a sort of tiny little party. That's where AMLO really comes to, to, to the center stage at the national level. He becomes mayor of Mexico City under that party. Uh, he breaks from that party uh, in, in 2012, 2013 as the party uh, tries to move to the center uh, under a label that party leaders at that period called uh, uh, responsible left, uh, quote unquote, which meant basically signaling that they were not radicals, that they were willing to compromise with the neoliberal center, etc. He breaks with them uh, in 2012, forms this organization that would later become uh, a party. So it's a very a new organization. In fact, many of its sort of institutional elements uh, in terms of uh, rules, internal rules of, 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 um, uh, of operation, how to choose a successor, that's one of the big issues that's going on uh, as we speak, uh, party leadership, all of that is really sort of in flux. It's, it's, it's an organization that had a few years of existence before it suddenly found itself at the helm of, 
of state power. And again, if we're going to think about it ideologically, if you, you know, look at its program, essentially, it's, it's basically a, a nationalist, developmentalist, uh, anti-neoliberal or post-neoliberal, depending on how precise you want to be with these terms, uh, organization. Now, at the same time, uh, I should say that there is, pr partly because it's such a new organization that also entered into state power so so uh, quickly, there is a significant amount of, of difference or, or lack of cohesion of what the organization is. It's particularly at sub-regional and local levels. Mm. Um, so uh, there's a big batch of, of people who win uh, uh, local positions in, in 2018, partly sort of under the wings of the huge victory of, of, of AMLO. And there at the at the local or sub-regional level, uh, again, it, it becomes ideologically much more fragmented. Right? So gotcha. that's important to say as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, let's just, I guess, talk about some of the successes of AMLO's time um, in office. And it, he, he came into office as you say, uh, trying to beat back neoliberalism and bring in like a new era. Um, it, it, there were pro-worker reforms uh, that had a lot of effect, uh, uh, is my understanding. What were some of those? What were some of the bolstering of, of social programs that he presided over? Right, right, right. I think there, there's been a huge uh, uh, sort of advance of pro-worker uh, reforms. I mean, we can get into, into some of them. The list is, is, is a long list. You know, off the top of my head, I can I can uh, mention uh, the institution of formal rights for domestic workers. You know, for the first time in the country's history, um, uh, the elimination of of a hiring practice called outsourcing uh, that allowed employers to evade all sorts of of otherwise uh, legally mandated bonuses that they would have to give to to their employees. This could be easily skirted by by uh, outsourcing, quote unquote, the the hires. Uh, there's been historic increase to uh, the minimum wage, mm. uh, increase of vacate of mandated vacation days. Uh, the work week uh, is in the process of being lowered. It's currently at 48. It's going to be lowered to 40. Um, yeah, those are just some of the 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 reforms that come to mind. A, a very important one is uh, labor reform that. In, that uh, dramatically facilitates the possibility of forming new unions, something that was really difficult to do uh, before this. And and how has the uh, working class or even the middle class responded to this? Right. I mean, has that has that support ma manifested itself in in polling and in like other races for his party? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a really important point, I think, because. There is an interesting thing that happened to the sort of social base of of his party or or, or you know, of support uh, that's different from the social base that put him in power in 2018. In 2018, the the working class vote was sort of scattered around the different parties. In in other words, there was really no working class vote per se as a block. They were just sort of you know to the extent that they they were part of the political process were absorbed by other uh, sorts of parties, including the neoliberal uh, bloc. And, and interestingly, uh, even uh, AMLO's uh, 2018 victory was partly on the with the support of, of, of the credentialed middle classes, sort of university um, uh, trained sectors. Right? Over the course of this presidency, there's been this uh, transition in the uh, change in the in the base in the composition of the base where it's become a much more working class popular base and the credentialed middle class faction sectors have uh, some at least not not all, not all but some at least have have abandoned uh, the uh, their support for him uh, so you have this transformation of the underlying social base uh, of of the party and I think you know the the, the growth of support for, from the working classes, the informal sector, which is a very, is very important sector in the country, in fact, might be the majority uh, of, of the country, depending on how you're counting it. So the 
the working class in the classic sense, the informal sector and the peasantry, the countryside, those are the real bastions of support in the present. And the business sector, not surprisingly, and perhaps surprisingly, credentialed middle classes are on the other end. Right? Mm. They're, 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 they represent the growing opposition. Well, and, and in terms of the opposition, like how has the business sector responded to some of these reforms? Right. Uh, there is, of course, a big backlash from the business sector. Uh, and one of the interesting developments uh, over the past years is the degree to which the business sector has come out on the public sphere to openly organize the opposition. So uh, as, as an, partly as an effect of, of the huge margin of victory in 2018, uh, all the other parties that had dominated politics throughout the neoliberal period were suddenly you know, reduced to, to, to tiny parties. Mm. And they have had to form a coalition Parties that historically were supposedly, you know, against each other uh, are now running as a coalition. That's their only chance of, of, of winning. Um, and, but that coalition requires, obviously, a huge amount of coordination, of money, of talking points, of uh, agreements to concede positions or spoils uh, between the different factions of the coalition. And... It's quite interesting that it's been the business sector again that has openly stepped, has to openly step into the public sphere as opposed to move just simply be behind uh, closed doors to organize uh, the opposition. Um, so uh, that's you know, that's the current state, I guess, of of, of the opposition. They are, um, I think, when they are put together, they do. Uh, particularly in some areas, can, can are, are within reach of winning. Right? But in general, I think they are uh, pretty weakened. Uh, they are really reactive to the president's agenda. They haven't been able really to set uh, any uh, agenda items uh, produced within them. Um, so uh, this, the success of the backlash, I guess, is... is is quite limited at this point. Well, I mean, that's good. Um, good to hear. Right. I I'm curious because there's been some characterization of AMLO in the press in, in, in the United States, like the New York Times, that mm -hmm. he has authoritarian tendencies. And I know he's been like fairly militant in a, and like uh, obsequious to Trump and Biden in terms of border policy. Um, right. What's the what's your what's your assessment of those criticisms? Right. I mean, I think uh, I don't agree with the criticism with those particular criticisms. There are other things actually that you know I would be I, I personally uh, would criticize and would be happy to talk about them if, sure. if, if you want. But uh, uh, in particular, those elements, uh, particularly the question of authoritarianism, I think is 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 a real um as a real mistake and i would say you know that um you know speaking to 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 uh us based audience that uh, we should read this accounts uh, of amlo in the liberal press like the new york times with the same level of consciousness or suspicion that we did when they were covering the bernie sanders campaign for mm. example which is they they do have a particular uh, agenda, even if it's unstated. It's a it's a liberal agenda, not conservative. But it also means they do have uh, they have a gripe against left wing populism, yeah. um, and so that is it, it, you know the the sort of general framing or bias of most of of, of the coverage. Not only it, it, it outside, I, you know, I would throw in Mexican media, mainstream media at least uh, there. Um, as well, um, so basically, uh, I mean, to, to put it in short, uh, when I read the New York Times uh, coverage of AMLO, I am basically reading transcripts of opposition talking points. Like it, it's basically a one-to-one, -one. Uh, and this, you know, could get into this why this happens, you know, but I think it has to do with the particular networks that uh, intellectual networks that you know, overlap between New York Times and Mexican media, et cetera. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think that that's kind of a through line, frankly, for Latin American coverage in institutions as well, like the Washington Post and um, and, and uh, the the New York Times. I mean. Yeah like how they covered Venezuela is a great example or uh, Bolivia. You, you see those kinds of um, they're very susceptible to that right, kind of right. stuff. Right. Yeah. So, so just to, for example, use an example uh, of an instance in which in which uh, that, that was sort of framed as authoritarian. There is this ongoing uh, back and forth between AMLO and the former head of the Electoral Institute, the institute in the country in charge of organizing elections. Right? So from a kind of simple perspective, uh, the fact that the head of the executive, that AMLO is criticizing uh, the head of the National Electoral Board, uh, looks bad, looks you know authoritarian. Of course, it's missing all sorts of context and history about what specifically the Electoral Institute has done, how it has operated, and the specifics of the, the tenure of that particular head of, of the Electoral Institute, who, just to you know, throw a couple of examples, um, a couple of years ago, already within in, into the AMLO presidency, was using el the Electoral Institute platform to give lectures against the perils of populism. This is the head of the electoral institute, the head of the you know the head of the organization in charge of organizing elections, lecturing about the perils of a movement without naming in particular a party or a leader, but we all understand you know what he's referring to. Yeah. Now that you know is a, a clear breach of of uh, of the neutrality that a judge that a you know a, a referee of elections should have. So. And that's just one example of you know growing tension between uh, between uh, that person and, and AMLO that became you know, increasingly uh, public, and the opposition was successful at sort of rallying around uh, the flag of defense of institutions against the populist authoritarian. And again, that's what I mean by uh, oftentimes the, uh, publications such as the New York Times really just picking up uncritically um, talking points of the opposition. In, in terms of the more substantive criticisms that you hinted at earlier, what would you list? Right. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, well, you did mention the question of, of um, the relationship to, to the U.S. government. Uh, uh, Along the border. The, yeah. The border. Yes. I mean, I think uh, there's no real way around the fact that there's been a sort of dismal record of, of, of defense of the rights of Central American migrants. Obviously, you know, the situation, the, the, the case is very complex, you know, has many sides or, or sort of levels of difficulty to it. I'm not, you know, trying to be sort of simplistic about it, but the at the end of the day, uh, the, the AMLO administration has basically uh, acquiesced with uh, the request by the U.S. government, uh, which again is not just Trump includes Biden and it presided to Trump as well to secure the southern border to uh, prevent Central American migrants from uh, going through the country and reaching uh, the, the the northern uh, border. And the ways of, of preventing this have uh, not exclusively, but significantly included the use of, of force. Mm -hmm. Not exclusively. Uh, there's also been an offering of Mexican visas and other sort of, you know, attempts to 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 deal with the request or demand of of, of the U.S. to to kind of you know to placate the the border. So I think there is a sort of uh, for forfeiting of, of sovereignty on that on that front um, uh, that you know that has happened. I think the other element that I would bring up here uh, is his relationship to to feminism. Amlo's relationship to feminism, which has been a sort of com complex one uh, as well. Uh, uh, on the one hand, he uh, sort of you know is, is proud to uh, boast that he has a, a, a cabinet conformed of you know fifty percent men and, and women. This is a explicit you know self uh, uh, imposed policy uh, of his government, right? To have gender parity in, in big appointments of that sort. 
Uh, but at the same time, there has been this very important and very militant uh, movement uh, of uh, women and feminist uh, street mobilizations, particularly around the question of femicides, right? which is an issue obviously that precedes uh, AMLO but continues uh, into his presidency. And he's really wavered about how to position himself in relation to that movement. I think his initial reaction was more interested in unmasking it as a plot by the right wing, partly because sectors of the right wing have tried to sort of hijack or jump on, 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 that, um, on that front, right, as a way of just kind of attacking uh, the, the government. But uh, missing the fact that in its core and in its bulk, uh, the movement is a, is a real movement, not, not a, a front for the right wing. Uh, so uh, has been uh, sort of ambivalent about how to work with the demands of, of the movement uh, and has been, for example, critical of... Uh, what in the U.S. is called direct action tactics, so sort of, you know, mm. sort of rioting elements of, of the tactics in ways that, you know, come off as um, condescending or, or even some degree tone deaf in relation to the severity of, of what the movement is pointing to, right? This persistence of, of femicides. So to focus on the methods of protest as opposed to the, the significance of the of the demand has been, I think, a problem. I mean, well said that that's that's very helpful to understand. Um, last question for you, Edwin, before I let you go. How does AMLO and his legacy fit into the larger resurgence of left wing movements that we're seeing? I mean, in the Americas, but really in, in, yeah. in Latin America right now. Right, right, right. I think, you know, as we start to think about the, the legacy of, of, of AMLO for the left, uh, th there's two things, there's three things that I think immediately come to mind. Um, uh, two that have to do with the, the particular phase of neoliberalism in which we are in, which is one in which there's been a significant uh, fragmentation and weakening of, of, the, of the working class as, as a political agent. Uh, and second, the, this process of hollowing out of, of the state, of state capacity. So uh, in that context, in the context of, let's say, the sort of decimation of, of neoliberalism on that front, I think the legacy is a revamping of class politics, right? at least an initial revamping of class politics, and a revamping of the power of, of the state. Right? Now, I would say a, a third element here, uh, which um, uh, I think is one of the sort of, let's say, unique elements of the government, at least in, in sort of the comparative historical perspective with other Latin American left governments or with uh, you know, populist movements of, uh, of the West more broadly, which is the particular conception of, of, ne of corruption as neoliberalism or the mm. link between neoliberalism and corruption. What's I think unique here is that whenever in previous instances um, in the country or, or in Latin America and more broadly, corruption in previous instances in which corruption has been taken up as a source of organizing or, or a political issue, it usually tends to be a right-wing demand that basically calls for a, a contraction of the state. It, mm. it is implied that it's an anti-statist sort of um, uh, demand. What's unique here is the use of an anti-corruption uh, message or platform in the service of advancing the interest of, of the left and in fact of regenerating the, the legitimacy uh, of the state. Uh, so those would be the three elements that I would think about in terms of a legacy for the left. Well, I um, really appreciate your time today. Edwin uh, F. Ackerman, professor at Syracuse University. The piece in New Left Review is entitled The AMLO Project. Uh, Edwin, thank you so much for your time yeah. today. I really appreciate it.
Thanks so much, Emma. For sure. All right, guys. Well, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program, the free hour of this program. But first, I just want to remind you, Against the Web, audiobook out right now, narrated by our very own Sam Cedar, Against the Web by Michael Brooks. What's the subheader there for the for the book? Oh. Um, yeah, we'll find it. But uh, you guys... Co- it's Against the Web, a cosmopolitan answer to the new right. Yes. I remember when I first got my Kindle, which I've kind of abandoned, but that was one of the first uh, books I got, um, Michael's oh, Against wow. the Web. So um, I read it on there. I want a physical copy, though, too. And But though for you guys, I mean, you get to hear Sam without ums and ahs narrating Michael's book. So... Go and get Against the Web, the audiobook. You can go on Audible or wherever you, you listen to audiobooks and, and hear it. It's going to um, be very surreal to hear a sound like that. I, I know. I know. It's, it sounds, it should, it kind of sounds probably like an AI version of him, but it is the real, the real Sam. Um, so uh, awesome stuff that Sam was able to do that. And on ESVN, we did a deep, deep dive into Live Golf, the Saudi money that is like uh, taking over the sport of golf, the merger-ish between uh, the, the fund that funds Live Golf and the PGA Tour, as well as we talked about the now concluded Stanley Cup um, finals and NBA finals, and also the state of the running back market in the NFL how running backs need to take back their powers as workers and consider a running back strike, honestly, to get a little bit more compensated for their contributions to the game. For actually absolutely destroying their bodies in, yeah. over the course of like five years uh, and, you know, some millions of dollars, but you better stretch out for the rest of your life and all the health ailments that are going to come Exactly. With and I mean, uh, for <laughs> not to get on the soapbox, but they are they are laborers as well. And for people that don't watch football, they get beat up in the first years of their very low contract. And by the time they're eligible for their second contract, teams are cheaping out and not paying them. Um, and that is a huge problem in the sport right now. YouTube.com slash ESVN show. Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Oh, yeah. Uh, Left Reckoning. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think David and I are going to do a, a patron show okay. um, uh, this weekend. Uh, so we had a big problem with our our streaming software so we're trying something new so uh, i think that's what we're going to uh bin it up with patreon.com slash left reckoning also on the post game on tuesday night i went deep into graphics cards and greedflation and how the investor class ruins everything uh with just uh speculative mania when there's perfectly good uh, graphics cards that need to be made so people can game at high uh, frame rates um for cheap prices so <laughs> <laughs> patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that all right awesome um and whoa, seamless. We're here. We're here. Um, what's up, guys? How are you? I and mean, we cannot hear you, Matt Bender. You got to fix your mic. Womp womp. Womp womp. But this, uh, now that we've shadow banned Matt Bender, gives Brandon Sutton an opportunity to say what's happening over on the discourse. Absolutely. We'll have a new episode out for fans of the show uh, this weekend. We'll be talking about Trump's indictment, uh, his newest indictment, I should say. Mm. Uh the rights war on KFC, obviously, and many other topics. All right. Wait, did you skip over the rights war on Chick Fil A? No, did you? They're also boycotting uh, KFC Diablo cups. Uh, because of the Diablo. Yeah, even though Diablo is about fighting evil, not like being evil. Oh, because of the Diablo video game. Yes. Right. They're like they're like a new hot sauce called Diablo. Well, you that's know, demonic. I, so. You know, there are people like the people that we are having this trans uh, arguments with, like they literally think like there's a non-zero chance that if they take Diablo hot sauce, they might actually be possessed by a demon. Well, um, that's like who we're dealing with. Matt Walsh, these people literally believe in demonic possession yeah. and we just have to act like we're parts of or members of a rational civil society <laughs> with them. <laughs> Rest yeah. in peace, Pat Johnson Robertson. Was like, I believe in demons. No, we get it. No, yeah, yeah. Like, it's like we get it, guys. You, you believe in spirits and demons, and we're yeah, right. Um, anyway, so Binder, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, there buddy. Oh, uh, what's I, happening? I was just. I don't before, know why I called you, know, you buddy like you were like my son or something. Hey, buddy. Hey, it's what's right. up, buddy? I call my son buddy. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't have children, so I don't know where that came from. But um, I'll be what's... your buddy, Emma. I'll be All your right. buddy. <laughs> Good to know what's happening on uh, the uh, doomed and scam economy. Sure. So on scam economy this week, I had on uh, Molly White of Web3 is going great. And we uh, dove into the uh, SEC lawsuits against Coinbase 
and Binance for selling unregistered securities. And in the case of Binance, actually, the lawsuit includes allegations of fraud. So definitely check that out at scameconomy.com and youtube.com slash mapbinder. Uh, is this the end of crypto in the US? Uh, we will see. And then on Doomed this week, I had on Madeline Peltz from Media Matters mm. uh, to talk about her, her trip to the Turning Point USA Young Women's Leadership Summit in Texas. And, you know, how it was full of people like Charlie Kirk and Benny Johnson and Candace Owens uh, telling uh, young women in their late teens and early 20s to uh, uh, say goodbye to any career uh, path they <laughs> would like to lead. And they should just stay home and have kids, hmm. um, just like they all did, of course. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, so check that out at doomthecast.com and at youtube.com slash Matt Binder. That seems like a pipeline to getting involved in MLMs. You know, taking yes. that advice. Of course. Yeah. Um, Bender, did you see the um, the the Dooley McKenzie predictions? Um, last year it was Web three is going to uh, uh, be worth five trillion dollars in the next year, and their most recent one is AI was going to be worth four point five trillion in the next five years. And it's really funny to me because, like, I think there's more to AI <laughs> than Web three bullshit. Yeah. And, but it just goes to show how fake all that shit is. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They basically probably, I mean, they probably, uh, and this is just a joke. I don't want anyone coming after me, but they probably <laughs> just copy and pasted the Web3 presser yeah. and just replaced AI uh, over the Web3 mentions. I Let's mean, it's lunch. literally just the same hype. It's the same hype. And like you said, it is unfortunate uh, because there are some, uh, you know, AI isn't Web3. There are, there is some use case and utility there. Uh, I think, you know, I think the biggest detriment is calling it AI because it's not yes. AI in terms of it's, like it's what we've been. advanced computer chips, which like, right, surprise, right. those have an effect on the world that like we should have like obvious. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um, all right, guys. Well, we'll talk about these kinds of things and more. Um, I'm very excited to play Carrie Lake's latest single in the fun half. YouTube.com. Wait, no. Uh, no, you're already watching. I was about to say ESVN again. Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, check us out in the fun half. The number is 646-257-3920. We will see you there. Call in. Have fun with us. Re we'll read your IMs, play some clips, take your calls. Bye-bye. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. 
Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. I am back in the nick of time. We are in the uh, phone lines, and I'm turning off the voicemail. So you can call in 646-257-3920. Cole from Michigan says, can we get some explanation on how this new tech isn't AI? Uh, which new tech specifically? I mean, a lot of it, yeah. Like, uh, the, oh, the term I think AI. it's good. Yeah, go ahead, I think it's because what I said. Yeah, I mean, what I mean it, when I said that was, you know, when we think of artificial intelligence, we think of like what we see, or at least what most people do. We think of like what we see in like, you know, sci-fi movies where like, you know, it's robots that can think and uh, come up yeah. with solutions on its own. Somehow That's not consciousness what this... emerged from the yes. technology. Yes. Yes, and they, they they decide to do something against its its master, you know, the users or whatever. But that's not what this is. These just these are just language models trained on all this data to basically put together uh, human like sounding sentences and paragraphs, and in some cases, entire blog post length, you know, uh, uh, output. Um, mm -hmm. The the like whether it's factual or whether the information is is le 